Welcome, everybody, to The Art of It All. I am Stephen Leinert. It's an honor to have a special guest, Chris Madsen, with me. Thank you so much, Chris, for being here. My pleasure, man. Um, Chris is a, um, a force to be reckoned with in the jazz community in Chicago, um, a published composer and arranger, Juilliard grad, DePaul grad, uh, four albums to date, five, well, the fifth one on the way. Mm. Um, so tell us a little bit about the musical upbringing. What was the? How did how did you arrive where you are? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's a, it's it's my honor to wow. be a, a guest here um, for this series. But um, so I actually grew up. You, you were kind enough to come all the way to my place here in Libertyville. Libertyville, and that's that's where I grew up, and that's uh, um, that's where I live now. And uh, I'll publish your address on the. On sure, the <laughs> please do. Yeah, yeah. Any and everyone's always open door policy. As, as all, <laughs> it's always awesome. Uh, so I grew up. I grew up here. Very, very fortunate to have um, you know have have grown up in a in a place that that had a strong public um, music program, cool. public school yep. music program. Um, and you know, I just I started saxophone in uh, fifth grade, and so that was the fir- out the gate. That was the first. Well, I, I did have a year of euphonium, which is a no it's other. Almost everyone has a year of euphonium. <laughs> I think. Somewhere in our past, I admire the people that maintain the euphonium, and they're making millions of dollars doing. <laughs> of course it. they are. Of course, aren't we all? <laughs> right. Uh, so I did. I did for whatever reason. I thought euphonium. I had never heard of it before, and I saw the uh, the uh, demonstration of it. Okay. And I, you know, nine-year-old me was like, "Whoa, what's yeah. that? I want to be unique. I want to sure. play that." And then the next year, I kind of realized, "Well, I think I think I'd rather play the saxophone." Okay. It was back then in the early '90s. It was um, saxophone was more of a part of the you know public Correct. discourse. It was like you still heard it in pop music, and absolutely. So that's kind of what drew me to it. I just thought it was a cool looking instrument, yep. sounding instrument, yeah. and so. Alto was the first one? Yeah, it started out on alto, and then I I pretty quickly switched to tenor. I I played alto for a few months, and I knew I wanted to play tenor. Uh, Again, because no one else did. None of the other kids were playing tenor, so I I wanted to get there um, to be unique. And uh, for a while, I was the only tenor in my my school, you know, band. And so, again, I just, you know, I have to to say that I I, um, had had that privilege of, of being able to you know, participate in a strong public um, band program, and that, that really it provided a, a strong foundation. By the time I got to high school, I was fortunate to have um, a band director who is kind of a legend in, in Illinois music ed. His name wow. is Don Shoup, okay. and he uh, he was great because you know his strengths lo- lay in the the wind ensemble thing as most um, sure. you know high school band directors. But he was he also had he had a real passion for jazz. And so we had a thriving jazz program. We had a couple of big bands, and we had one or two combos. And and, um, and so I was, in addition to him, there was just this, there was this uh, back then sort of a um, a, a feeling, uh, sort of a, an environment that that was really copacetic to jazz mm-hmm. and learning how to improvise. And so okay. all the students, we kind of, we had this little group of friends that we were all these listening together sure. and, and transcribing and 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 we would call each other and talk about music and At we would what practice. Age? So this is about thirteen or fourteen that's, when I yeah it was that's pretty awesome. Wild. Yeah, yeah, and the upperclassmen had kind of come through and okay. everyone just really wanted to be good improvisers and play, play jazz and learn about it. Um, so I just kind of got swept up into that environment. Okay. And uh, if you know, I basically decided I wanted to be a professional jazz saxophonist when I was about 14 um, and uh, I, I've had you know I fell off the wagon a couple times along the way but mm-hmm. most of mostly I've, I've sort of been focused on that ever since that age and then um, yeah like you mentioned I went to DePaul got a jazz studies degree there um, and then after that I moved to New York and went to Juilliard I okay. lived there for three years and got my artist diploma at, at Juilliard and now uh, when I was in my mid thirties, I, I decided to go back and get my doctorate. So now I'm enrolled in a doctoral program at U of I. Okay. So then that should be I should be done with that in the next year or so. Jazz focused. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. jazz performance. So is is that going to be lectures and recitals or lecture mm-hmm. recitals and yeah, all? lecture recitals okay. actually. Yeah, and, and I have published to do, work or is it going to be more of the artist diploma route where it's performance? It's per, it's performance. I yeah. mean, it's a DMA, but the focus is uh, they give you a bunch of different options for what sure. you can focus on. Yeah. You know, 
do a long dissertation and no recitals. I choose to do the least amount of writing necessarily. <laughs> yeah, I think that's it's a very popular choice it for is. musicians, yeah. uh, you know, to do that. So I have to do sort of a, a scholarly essay, is what yep. they call it, and then a couple of lecture recitals. Wow. Um, but yeah, I, I've been doing that for the past two years, and I should have about another semester's worth of courses, and then I, I'll be done after that. Wow! Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks, man. Thank you. That's great. So, when you were in New York, um, you know, you you played with the Whitmer Marsalis Quartet, mm. um, played a gig with Paul Simon. Yeah. Talk sure. about how some of those how some of those things come come to pass. Are they things you went and looked for? Are they things mm. that kind of fell into fell into your lap? They definitely fell into my lap because <laughs> if I hadn't been enrolled in Juilliard at the time. I would not have had those opportunities okay. for sure. So uh, Juilliard provided the springboard sort of into a certain scene there. And um, it, it was, uh, they really did a great job of giving students performing opportunities <laughs> and um, recording opportunities and, yeah. and just opportunities to play with lots of the great, you know, jazz minds of our sure. day. So those were, those both came through the, the Juilliard thing. Okay. I mean, it was... It wasn't necessarily a Juilliard gig, but if I hadn't been enrolled there and the call comes into the office and then they recommend certain students to do yeah. this or that, and so that's kind of how those came to pass. And then I got to know Winton a little bit through that okay. and some other people in that scene and, and yeah. uh, kind of got to know them outside, but it was through Juilliard for sure. When you, when you arrive to a rehearsal on that level... Obviously, it's it's different than a high school jazz band rehearsal or even mm-hmm. a collegiate level jazz like rehearsal. Mm-hmm. How are those rehearsals run, and how what was your mindset going into to those rehearsals? Like, mm-hmm. it's an art to know how to be in a rehearsal, whether mm-hmm. you're leading it or just participating it. What yeah. was how how were they run? I mean, were, was, yeah. it, was it an organized thing or was it was it a disorganized thing? Well, both in both of those situations, I remember the rehearsals were. were barely even occurred. I mean, there, and one of them, the thing with Paul Simon was actually a, um, was a benefit for the, the Katrina survivors. Yep. Uh, and it was nationally televised, I think. I forget what network it was on, but it was like a primetime thing when they were doing benefits. Yeah. And I remember getting to the TV studio and Paul walked in with a couple of his, you know, aides. And, and yeah. uh, we basically had a rehearsal for, I think, maybe a half hour. And it was, uh, we were supposed to learn... Uh, it, it, I guess to answer your question directly, I think, you know, on that level, you're basically required to be prepared beforehand and sure. do most of the rehearsing on your own yeah. and the preparation, you know. Much like an orchestra is. Exactly. And, and um, yeah, it was, it was very short, and we, we, we kind of ran through it a couple times, and that was it. And the thing with Winton, uh, that was for... Uh, I played with him a, a couple of times, but there was one that was sort of... Um, for the grand for the grand opening of the new Jazz at Lincoln Center facility on uh, a Columbus Circle uh, in uh, 04, I think, um, and then that was basically talking through finding a tune that that we wanted to play as a group, and maybe I don't even remember if we've actually played. I think we did because we did a tune that I didn't know. We did Oscar T by by Thelonious Monk. Uh-huh. I hadn't heard that tune before yeah. that, and I was kind of in over my head because I didn't really know the tune so I had to rely on him for the melody yeah. and then I'd rely on my ears for to, to improvise on it. That brings up an, an interesting point that I've, I've, I often think about. Obviously I came to jazz late so I don't, I'm sure. not an encyclopedia of tunes um, thus I'm probably the most frustrating side man on gigs <laughs> but it always fascinates me to hear someone who's deeply entrenched in the world say I didn't know that tune or to hear to, yeah. to witness someone call a tune and people not know it. in my right. very ignorant outsider world I think all the pros know every tune in mm-hmm. every real book and they have that USB PDF of every single <laughs> yeah. real book in the world and they just know <laughs> tunes so it's, it, it's not the case all the time that yeah. people know all, all the tunes you know Definitely. unless unless you spent 40 years on a cruise ship and you probably do but like <laughs> yeah. is that I don't know. To me, it, it would be a tough thing to admit that I don't know a tune. And is that something as a professionalist, like, you know, I don't know that tune. Like, if we're yeah. on a jam session and someone calls a tune, like, it's better just to be a friend like, I don't know that head. You know, I mean, is that is that something yeah. to process? And are you always on a relentless pursuit to learn tunes? Yeah, I'm, I, I definitely, well, that, that brings up a whole other conversation about the relevance of, 
of repertoire as we go forward in the yeah. art form. And, I've seen and, some of those conversations on social media about yeah, standards, how important yeah. are standards. And yeah, like that. I put up a poll about that a, a few yeah, months ago. Yeah, I remember and, seeing that. And I'm very, very interested at the conversation. I love those kind of just uh, those brainstorming yeah. things. And a lot of people weigh in. So anyway, th- that's kind of a tangent, I guess. <laughs> but but um, I, I personally you know, came up in a time when repertoire was really... Um, I feel like there was a huge emphasis on it, and and part of my daily practice routine was learning repertoire every every day. I always have to learn new tunes, always know, and it's got to be all kinds of tunes, you know, Cole Porter and Horace Silver, wow. and all the different, you know, the different situations you might find yourself in. Um, nowadays, uh, I just I get the sense that um, tune learning tunes is utilitarian. Uh, it's less it's less about um, you know, will this tune be called right. on you? And it's more about learning the craft of songwriting, you know, yeah. and, and sort of understanding how are tunes made and thus how does jazz harmony work and oh. how can it be manipulated and, and that kind of yeah. thing. Um, or how does jazz counterpoint work, you know, the harmony uh, functions with the melody and that sure. kind of thing. Um, but I personally, I've, I, I, I always thought it was important to learn as many tunes as possible and I hated being the uh, the person who didn't know a tune when it was called yeah. to me. So I always, and to this day, you know, I make a, I have a, a list of tunes. If someone calls a tune, I don't know it. I got to learn it because, yeah. you know, I don't want it to happen again. And, and sure. that's another part of the jazz world that I need to know about. Yeah. But, you know, I, I don't learn tunes with the ferocity that I used to because, I, you know, at this point, I, you know, we're working professionals. We can get through gigs without, yeah. without reading a, an iReal Pro, hopefully, or... sure. Whatever. So I, I can I know, I know enough tunes to get to get through. But um, yeah, I think it's important to just have that that running list of. I tell all my students that too, regardless of what level they're at. But if if, if someone calls a tune you don't know it, you you have to keep uh, keep it on a list, and you have to learn it. Yeah. Unless it's some far fetched tune that you that is sort of so outside the realm of possibility right. that it's not even worth your time. Right. So, uh, yeah, but then again, you know, at that, I was 22 or whatever when that happened. Yeah. And he called Oscar T. And I'd, I'd like to think that if someone called that now, okay, I learned my lesson. And, sure. Um, but, yeah, it was tough. It was because I, I would m- have felt much more confident playing a tune that I was really right. uh, really comfortable with. But to it for it to be recorded yeah. and for there to be press everywhere and for me to be standing next to Wynton Marsalis and his group at that time, no you know, <laughs> it was the pressure, the pressure was on and, yeah. uh, um, yeah, but somehow we, we made it through. All right. Yeah. Cool. So you have, uh, four albums out. Right. Um, and, uh, one on the way. Mm-hmm. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting question I'd like to ask people if you had sort of like, like one of some of the desert island questions. Mm hmm. To date, if you could only have recorded one thing, whether it's your project or it's something else, or the, some of the projects you've been on, yeah. you could only take one with you or tell someone, listen to this mm-hmm. to date. What out? Al- what project? Would yeah, it be? specifically a project. That's a. I love the question, and I was always really surprised. I, I remember reading a, a couple biographies of you know of Train. Yeah, and. I remember and interviews too, and I was always really surprised, just given the nature of Coltrane's searching, protean quality, that the fact that he always had to have to be moving forward. You know, yeah. I remember reading an interview with him. I don't know, I forget, it was sixty one or somewhere in there, yeah. and someone asked him what, you know, what project he he liked the most. What was his desert, desert island project? And I think he mentioned Blue Train, which is really surprising to me because. Um, you would you would assume that he would have said whatever the latest one was, you yeah. know, because the latest one is the 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 high the one that that shows him at his most highly evolved. Yeah. But he chose, you know, Blue Train, which which is a, obviously everyone loves that album. Right. It's a great album, but um, it didn't it wasn't the most recent project that he was involved with. So I think there was some magical element that had to do with that recording session and the way everything came together. Sure. But for me. Not in any way to compare myself to John Coltrane. I would never be so bold, but <laughs> I'm. I would like to think that you know the the one that's coming out soon, Bonfire, yeah. with, with this new quartet that I have, 
is for sure um, the the best representation of where I am artistically now. Okay. And I would much prefer anyone listen. If someone's going to listen to an album of mine, I would much prefer they listen to the one, the yeah. most recent one. Oh, yeah, I know. Because I just feel... Um, I'm proud of it. I'm, I, I, and, but, but, but also it's, I, I think I, I'm just, you know, as, as we hope to do as jazz musicians or as artists in general, we hope to keep growing. Right. And so why wouldn't you want, you know, your most recent work sure. to, to be the best showcase of what yeah. you can do? So I, I hopefully, I feel that that comes across with yeah. the latest one. And we'll drill down a little further. Mm hmm. If you could only have recorded one song, one yeah. tune to date, yeah. again, whether it's yours or someone else's, what what one tune would be would be your Desert sure. Island tune? Well, um, I think it will be, not to make this sound too promotional, but no. it would be the single that we've chosen from the new album, okay. which is Bonfire. It's a, it's okay. the eponymous single, yep. and it'll be released, a, a, I'm not sure... A, at least a, a month or so before the actual release date of the album, okay. but I, I'm, I've, I'm, I think compositionally, I'm really proud of that song, and, it, and you, I can tell when a song is going to be, when I'm going to feel good about it, because um, yeah. I don't know if you, you get this in in your tune writing too, but the more time I spend on something, I just always feel like it pays off. Yeah, you know absolutely. what I mean. If I throw a tune together in ten minutes and yeah. it's a sketch, yeah, it's fine. But mm -hmm. it doesn't. Yeah, it it it's not like a, your baby. But there's also something you know really I mean? special about putting it in front of people whom you trust. Yeah, yeah. And hearing what happens like when they take yeah. your ideas from you sitting at the piano and working things out to yeah. suddenly, wow, I have a real pianist, a real bassist, a real drummer working yeah, through right. this. That's a it's a pretty Spectacular thing. Yeah, absolutely. Like, there are I definitely mean, songs that we've sketched that were like, "Ah, oh, this will be okay." But then you put it in front of other people, and I'm like, "Oh wow, I didn't realize it would go. It would go there." So yeah, that's a beautiful thing about jazz I mean, is that you rely so much on the the people. It's less about what they're reading, and it's more about right. their interpretation of it. And as long as you're okay with that as a composer, right? You know, I think certain composers like things to be more sort of by the. And I, I have certain tunes, and I'm sure you do, is tunes that you need to be played a very specific way, and then other tunes that are much more open to interpretation. Yeah. Um, and this one, this bonfire tune, I, I, it's kind of loosely, um, Chick Corea is one of my favorite composers, obviously. I share Brilliant. that, I share that with you. I'm sure. I, yeah. I mean, um, he, a uh, great thing about Chick is that he, I think, considers himself a composer first, you know, and a, mm -hmm. and a pianist second, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. But I definitely don't consider myself a composer first, but I think Chick is a great example of someone who straddles the line between a brilliant player and his compositions are equally mind blowing. Yeah. You just don't get that very right. often. So I I you know I've been listening to Chick for years and there, um I, this tune that I wrote Bonfire is sort of the form of it is based on um off of this tune that Chick wrote okay. uh called New Life which is on this obscure record that no one okay. seems to know called Time Warp which okay. is one of my favorite albums Never of all heard. time. <laughs> yeah, see no yeah. people just don't know it. Um but it, it was big when it came out. It came out in '95, I think. And, and uh, there was, was so much else going on in the world in '95. I feel like <laughs> just, yeah. there are certain genres that just kind of get swallowed. Totally. Up. Yeah. Yeah. It's completely. Um, but anyway, so so it's a. I just I really like his writing and this tune especially. It, it it goes a bunch of different directions and it's got a bunch of different time, uh, uh, you know, time feels and and okay. sub sort of subgroupings and, yeah. and with that he does over this this big three feel and he just yeah. groups it in all these different ways but it feels like a composition it feels like one piece okay and i wanted that to happen with all my tunes but especially with the single that we're going to release and yeah. i'm happy with the way it came out when you're writing some of these tunes and you're you're crafting it from from soup to nuts so to speak mm -hmm. When you do you have certain bass lines in mind certain drum grooves in mind and when you're working with a group do you feel the confidence and the comfort level to, to say, hey, this is the bass line I have in my head here. Here's the specific drum groove I have in my mind. And do oh, you, yeah. sort of a two-part question, mm -hmm. do you intentionally work with people that are receptive to that? Because there's definitely mm -hmm. musicians that, all right, we're not calling anybody out. I'm just saying no, there's certain true. musicians that are, this is, I really want to interpret 
your song the way I want to do it, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I don't want to hear how you want it done. Are you comfortable as a band leader and as a composer and arranger saying, play this bass line? Yeah, oh, definitely. Okay. Definitely. I think to try to sort of answer both parts of the question at once, I, you know, to choose people that can uh, respect the composition but can also elaborate on it yeah. is really important. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, I, I'd like to think that the, my working band that I have now definitely is that way. Yeah. I mean, there are specific, I know it's very, <laughs> I tend to write very piano heavy. Yep. Um, and I tend to base most of the stuff around the piano because, you know, that's where we're sitting okay. at when we write. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, so a lot of it falls on the, 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 the head of the pianist in my sure. group's. But, um, and who is in your group, by the way? Stu Mindeman is our pianist. He's a world guy. Everyone's world You're really scraping class. the bottom of the barrel. I know. <laughs> I tried try to get someone <laughs> decent. to get someone good, but he, he responded to the Craigslist. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and Stu Mindeman, uh, you know, who, who, uh, plays with the variety of our, just had an album released, I think, last year. Yeah. Fantastic. And Clark Summers, bassist, who's. We share the again, same birthday, by the way. You and Clark? No, no and Clark, kidding. Yeah. Oh, very yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's in August, right? September. Or September? Yeah. yeah, okay. As a band so leader, you should up. know that. You I should. should. You're, You're absolutely right. What a disappointment. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll edit that out. <laughs> of course, please do. And then, uh, and then, of course, Dana Hall, okay. who I, uh, who I, I kind of, um, you know, I, I asked him to play, and I wasn't sure just because of, uh, you know, his his uh, schedule and right. availability and everything, but. He he was he was down and he was uh, we we had sort of played a couple of times before that and you have a trio thing with him and Clark I do yeah that's another project we have called the trio book I also have the duet book which is just me Clark and I and so yeah those are all I'm sorry about the mic (laughs) Um, those are all yeah kind of in those are all in in the works right now but the court the working quartet that I've that I've put together for the past couple of years about um, yeah it's been Stu and Clark and Dana and and so those guys are just really able to do what you were saying, which is, you know, if there's something written specifically, they will yeah. religiously adhere to that. Yeah. And then, um, you know, and they will also be very, they're very keen on shaping the music the way that you intend it to be. Yeah. And um, I try to be that when I'm a sideman, too. I try to, you know, only, I think it's important not to take too many liberties without permission. Mm-hmm. It, when you're playing someone's original music, you want to uh, maybe, you know, interpret it in the way that feels most natural to you yeah. because someone wouldn't have asked you to play their music if they didn't trust you in a Correct. certain way. Correct. But you also, you have to sort of straddle that line of... of it's like being invited to a party. You know what I mean? It's almost like being yeah. invited to someone else's home yeah. at, for an event. You know, like, you've been invited for a specific reason. Sure. Whether you're a good conversationalist or whether you're just interesting or, or whatever. <laughs> exactly. But, like... You also don't want to suddenly be the life of the party or take their party or their cocktail hour in a, a d- different direction, right? You want to sort of get a feel for how things are going and then obviously be yourself and have your own voice. And I think chamber yeah. music, whether it's classical or jazz, the same is the same way. Like, I totally be, agree. Be the welcome addition that people hope, hope you're going to be. Absolutely. Um, when people hear your music, so let's say you and I are going to sit down and we're going to listen... To an album together, what are you, what are you wanting people to listen for? How are you wanting your music to affect them from a listening standpoint? Yeah, I would, um, I would sort of hope that people are able to, um, you know, enjoy it on a visceral level, uh, which is actually something that I've been struggling with lately mm. about about um, music itself and, and sort of how not just jazz, but how to listen to music in a way that is not, um, I don't know, what, what word can I use? But it's not, uh, in, in a way that is substantive, yeah. you know, and um, sort of really getting to the messages that are being conveyed directly to you from the artist and from the production and from the, the songwriting and all that. And um, there's... there's <clears throat> A few albums and a few styles of music that can I, I can just kind of let it wash over me mm-hmm. and, and enjoy it that way. But I actually feel like <clears throat> to listen to it from an intellectual level, it just it's more it's, it, it it grants more to the listener, and it's more I think the way that the music was intended. Even even um, even like what what they used to call smooth jazz or muzak mm-hmm. or whatever. Listening to that music. 
just kind of letting it pass in one ear and out the other is maybe relaxing, but there's still thought processes sure. happening in the creation yeah. of that music too. Sure. And I, I, I find it to be a real challenge. It's almost like meditating, you know? It's yeah. like uh, trying to concentrate on the music yeah. that's playing, no matter what style it is. Yeah. <clears throat> trying to think about the songwriting and the production and the choices that were made yeah. by each individual artist. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, oh, it's all right. Um, and we can pause if you need water. Sure, no, that, I think I'm okay. <clears throat> Did you need any water, I'm by okay. the way? Um, I should have offered that when you first no, got in. Sorry. sorry. As um, a band leader, you were... You, I know. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, yeah, I, I just... I would challenge people, not just with my music, because I don't think my music is special in that way or anything. Sure. I just mean, I think listening to all music with with one ear to the deeper levels of it. Mm-hmm. I, that's the way I challenge my students. I, I teach at UIC. I teach a jazz... A pre, basically a jazz history appreciation. Yeah. And most of the people in that class have never heard jazz before, quite honestly. Okay. I mean, they're they're not musicians. Yeah. Um, they have no musical training, and if it, you're probably not going to get exposed to jazz in 2019 unless you're playing it, right. Or you know, in yep. jazz band in high school or something. So to challenge them to listen to music in a in a deeper way, I think is is illuminating for them. And then when I make comments, uh, and say I play something for the class, and I make comments about how to listen to certain things, I can sort of see them, you know, thinking about music in a different way, in a deeper yeah. way. So I would just challenge people to sort of, not to necessarily dodge your question, but I think mm-hmm. I, I have been challenging myself in all kinds of music, no matter how simplistic it might sound, to listen to it analytically and thoughtfully. Yeah. And I would hope that people listen to my music and all, all music that way. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Do some of these principles transfer to the live setting? So when you're out there live and you're 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 playing, yeah, what's going through your head? What are you hoping? What are you hoping is happening when there's so like, for instance, I recently had the privilege of seeing you at Studio Five. With, oh, thanks, man. With 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 the gang. Yeah, and, yeah, that was a really um, fun gig. There were a lot of cool things going on in that room, but it was real good listening. Like, there were people really in tune with what was, what was going on. Mm-hmm. You were very much a sideman there, but when you played, there was an absolute command. What is going through your mind when you're playing live, and what are you hoping... What's that? Yeah. What's, what's going on between you and the audience that you're hoping is happening? Yeah. Um, well, I, it kind of reminds me of... So I'm kind of a big... Uh, comedy fan like a mm-hmm. stand up comedy I listen to a lot of comedy podcasts yeah. and I'm kind of interested in that the process behind that sure and stand up comedians will will talk about you know losing the room and and, sure. and f- they can just feel the yep. change in the audience yeah. and you know where I'm going with this of course so which is you can feel when the audience is with you and yeah. when hanging on your notes and when they're not yeah and um you, you know, I feel like we're always trying to get to a state of having the audience with with you, no matter what you're doing. Do you, you know? adjust when you when you're let's say you're in the middle yeah. of a solo and you kind of sense or you suddenly become aware that the room is mm. slipping? Do you adjust what you're playing to try and reel them back in, or do you stay committed to your your concept and your ideas and wait for the next event? Well, I would, I, I guess, I kind of would hope that. Every problem on the bandstand can be solved by just opening your ears up more. I'm a firm believer in that. And so, Absolutely. you know, if I if I do feel them slipping or if I feel like, you know, the solo isn't being generative or it's just not going where I hoped it would go. Yeah. Um in any in any respect, I would I would hope that centering myself and again kind of back to the meditative aspect of opening yourself up to the stuff that's happening in the moment with your bandmates mm-hmm. and allowing that to reinvigorate the the proceedings. Yeah. And so I I I, I guess it it depends. I mean, you know, you talk about a club like Winters where your um your audience is mostly comprised of non-musicians. You know, they're tourists or they're they're yeah. people who are fans of the music maybe or sitting 6 feet away from you. Yeah, exactly, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. In a in a in a quiet room where right. everyone in there, at, a, at an environment like that, it's very, I feel like, very obvious when the audience is not there. Because even while you're playing, you can feel there's just something about it. You yeah. know, there's something transcendental about the mm-hmm. energy or something. Absolutely. I don't know what it is, but there's something about the audience that you, you can just tell 
they're not with me on this. Yeah. I'm losing them. They're bored. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think y- the last thing I would ever want to do is sacrifice the integrity of the music because that's mm-hmm. first and foremost, no matter what. Yeah. Um, but I think there are ways to engage the audience in, you know, with certain kinds of energies that doesn't sacrifice the integrity of the music or the interaction of the mm-hmm. music. And so trying to find that balance is really tough. Yeah. And then you compare an environment like Winters to, you know, playing a, a, a local gig for mostly musicians, you know, at yeah. the Cafe Mustache or some, sure, sure. some environment where it's like only musicians mm-hmm. in the audience. And you don't really have to worry about that there yeah. because they are listening. They're just willing to take whatever it is that you're dishing out and yeah. I think they're they're with you even if it's not going the way that you wanted yeah, yeah so and that brings up another question when you're it's kind of broad so we can we can get specific if we mm-hmm. need to but when you're choosing what music to record or what music to play live so mm-hmm. when you're putting together an album or you're putting together a set list and you are in charge of all that that's the scenario where you are in charge yeah are you primarily picking music that you want to play that's satisfying something within you Mm. are you choosing music that you're gearing towards people with a musical understanding who are going to get the nuances or are you choosing music that the mass public is going to appreciate and latch on to well i think to take the easy answer it would be uh situation specific Mm-hmm. You know, in club specific, or or in, uh, you, if you know what kind of audience you're in the military, they say terrain dictates. Terrain, so, dictates. <laughs> terrain dictates. Totally. So, yeah. yeah, that's the same. It's the same deal. Uh, well, I, yeah, when choosing repertoire, um, yeah, boy, there's just the, what what you could talk about this all day, really. We but really but we're actually um, going to. This is actually a 24 hour <laughs> interview. It's going to be incredible. I forgot to mention, but uh, no, hey, yeah, you know, thanks for. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know yeah, at some yeah. point. Heads you know, up, yeah. that I appreciate it. Um, I think to, to go back to just being aware of your audience, you know, and there are certain clubs like to go back to Winters. Yeah. Are you just trying to get more gigs? Nothing, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I mean, <laughs> we'll put the website on the screen. Don't worry. I just said we were talking about it before off air, <laughs> yeah. and we both play there, so right. you, you know, you yeah. know, you know, what the yeah. environment is like. Yeah. But in a club like that, or um, a club where you know you're going to be playing for. Uh, an audience mm-hmm. um, that is not necessarily uh, a musically sophisticated in, in the sense that you're, they're not musicians themselves. Um, yeah, choosing repertoire that you think is going to resonate with them is important. Like, for example, um, I just did a weekend there. Alyssa Allgood and I kind of have yeah. a, every few months a standing thing it's that we very do there. Cool. It's cool. Yeah, thanks. It, um, it, it's sort of a qu- quintet that she and I uh, do. Mm-hmm. With a kind of rotating rhythm section, and, and it's always themed. They, 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 he really likes to have a theme yeah. there at that club. And so the last theme we, that we did was the Johnny Hartman, John Coltrane One of my album. favorite albums. I, Incredible. I, I tried to run through every wall I could to make it to that show because that album has a huge impact in my sure. musical world. Oh, um, yeah. So I incredible. was, when I saw that that was the theme, oh, it killed sure. me that I couldn't make it. Oh, that's, but. that's quite all right. But, you know, um, it's one thing to play the the music from that album, and that that those are American songbook standards, and um, and that that's they're they're with a singer, and so th- those are uh, factors that sort of help communicate better with a with a general audience. Yeah, both of those things, right? But um, you know, when I'm picking the instrumental portion of it, which, which are basically John Coltrane tunes. Those tunes can be a little more wonky, yeah. And so I, I did kind of wrestle with: well, should I do this yeah. tune? Should I do that? Or should I do a tune like "Bye Bye Blackbird" that he sure. is known for but didn't right. write? And we ended up doing kind of both. We did we did some standards that he played, and I tried to sort of pay homage to his style and his approach, yeah, as much as is humanly possible. But yeah, and then also we did some trained tunes, and at a certain point, it's just you know the audience is there to see jazz. And you're going to right. be playing jazz, and you can't water it down too much because yeah. it's just it just is what it is. It is jazz, you yeah. Know? Um, and then there are other environments, um, like we played the uh, uh, the Jazz Up Glen Ellen Festival with my quartet a few uh, last month, and um, that is much different. Where you know I had some originals on there, and then we I would choose tunes. I like to choose 
you know, jazz tunes that are a little bit more off the beaten path, uh, tunes that, uh, that maybe kill two birds with one stone. For example, a tune that I know I need to learn, but I haven't yet. Well, if I program it for a gig, right. I have to learn you it have now. have to learn it, right. And, um, and yeah, that kind of thing. Uh, like this, this uh, tune called Snow Peas. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's by Phil Markowitz, who's a New York pianist, yeah. but it was recorded by Bill Evans. Okay. And so it's a tune that I've always kind of, I've heard, you, you know, every couple of years I'll hear about it. So I know it's out there, yeah. and I know that I need to know it. Yeah. But I had no reason, or I was too lazy to learn it on my own, so okay. I just programmed it for a gig. Okay. Uh, and I learned it for that gig, and so, you know, there you go. So, you have a lot of things going right now. You have a duo project, a trio project, a quartet project. Yeah. You are sidemen for various for various groups. Do you choose? Are you intentional about choosing your sideman? Do you saying yes to a sideman gig hmm. as a compliment <clears throat> to your? main thing or oh, as a contrast to main things like do you want do you accept something as a challenge or do you accept something because yeah well i'm, I'm kind of working in that vein so this will help me with that tone development or that kind of a tune development yeah. or does that cross your mind at all uh yeah it, it crosses my mind in the sense that i i think it's really important for me personally to be sort of uh involved in different aspects of of the music and of the scene and yeah. i really like to play original music uh whether it's mine or someone else's you're know, mm-hmm. interpreting that i love doing that but i yeah. also um i i, I don't want to just be known for that just like i don't want to only be known for playing uh standards or playing yeah. with vocalists or doing that so I, I i really love the challenge that you mentioned challenge i think it is a big challenge to sort of alter your concept to play original music and then go and play you know like a nancy wilson tribute like the thing that you saw um and how do, how are those approached differently? What are, what are the common factors between them? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, stylistically, like yeah. can you pull the same stuff out of your bag in an original setting that you sure. can? And yeah, the answer is yes. But but I also like the um, the challenge of sort of um, playing those different musics authentically. Sure. Like I have I don't know if you've seen this. Here, I have this other series that I've, I, I haven't updated in a while called the uh, Alternate Jazz History. It is. I have <laughs> sent some of those links all over the country to, to various people. It is so. And it's, you you are actually you. you are talked about when your name has come up on various things. Like, dude, have you seen this thing that he's doing? <laughs> really? It is really inventive. And it's. Thanks, man. I was telling to someone. I don't know who I was telling, but it was like it's one of those things I wish I had thought of. <laughs> right. And he's like, yeah, I wish I'd thought of doing that too. Yeah. It's, you have sort of captured something that we all think about, but we don't really know how to express. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I, I appreciate that very much. Yeah, I remember you sending a message. Yeah. I really appreciate that. But um, that it's the same thing. It's, yeah. you know, I want to be authentic to whatever yeah. person I'm replicating. I don't want to let any of me in there. Yeah. Uh, it's got to be inhabiting the body of this person. Yeah. And I, just being true to that yeah. is the same kind of thing where it's like I want to be true to... This composition, yep. this standard. I, w- I want to play the standard the way I, I know it should be played. Yeah, and and uh, that's something that was really a t- a, a, a Juilliard mindset was, you know, playing repertoire the way the repertoire dictates, not the way that you personally dictate it. Yeah, um, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about about being a sideman, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, putting kind of a lot of yourself into it versus um, following the instructions. Yeah, there are there's kind of instructions. In the subtext of every tune, no matter what it is, yeah. And I think it's our job to kind of figure out what that subtext is and and express ourselves appropriately. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't want to bust out uh, on that Nancy Wilson thing. I wouldn't. Uh, you know, playing a Coltrane Matrix over Never Will I Marry is probably not the best choice. Maybe not the best choice, <laughs> unless you know we have the lava lamps going and some other <laughs> some other things right. happening. But yeah, and that's yeah. I I wonder this too. One of the, one of I think. Um, in my humble but correct opinion, one of <laughs> one of your strong points, from what I've observed in your playing, is your ability to adapt your tone to your environment. Oh, thank and you. And so, do you think about that um, with when it comes? And now we're getting real specific as mm-hmm. it as it applies to read choice and oh, sure. or mouthpiece choice or air control. Like if you're playing, let's say you're doing something with Alyssa. Mm-hmm. Versus if you were doing something with, like, Paul Marinaro, mm-hmm. or if you were doing something with, like, a shout section. Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. do you 
do you have different gear with you, or do mm. you do you, how do you approach having to adapt your sound to an environment? Wow, it, this question coming from a non saxophonist is incredible. <laughs> you know, because it uh, I, I admire you for asking because if you really want to get nerdy about it, we can Dude, get we can I get mean, nerdy. Let's talk shop. I mean, there are people. If anyone's watching this far, they'll probably they're probably hoping that we'll get to shop. Talk, probably so. right. Well, okay, so. Maybe this is maybe there's an analog to this for vibes. I don't know, but um, choosing gear. There are so many options for yeah. mouthpieces and yeah. reed combination. So many ways to get oh a new mortgage God. to buy new gear. I know. <laughs> yes. yes. So um, for me, I like to choose gear that is um, that both gets me um, the. Wait, sorry. To I'm just trying to choose my words carefully here, but I'm trying to choose gear that gets me to express my voice clearly, yeah. and I don't want to sacrifice that at all. Sure. So if I'm if I'm really you know if I really have a certain tone in my head, that tone needs to be coming out, and I need to get the gear that will let that happen. But I think there's given all of our choices on the market today, I think. Having gear that also allows you to slip in and out of other, let's say, influences is very important too. Yeah. For example, I used to play on a mouthpiece that was very restrictive, but it gave me a very unique tone and a very unique sort of phrasing quality to it. Yeah. But I could never have played uh, like a pop or funk thing on it. Okay. It just wasn't. It was like a Joe Henderson mouthpiece. You okay. know, just imagine Joe Henderson playing over "I Will Survive." <laughs> Again, we're back to that incredible <laughs> series that you're doing. <laughs> Hey, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a bad idea, but Joe Joe is such a consummate artist that he was he was able to just you know have that singular tone and play um, kind of his bag, you know. Yeah. For me, I just I like I have a funk band too called Kings of the Lobby, and I really yeah. like to. I don't I don't want to sort of uh, you know ha- go halfway in on that right. music. I want to have a tone that is authentic. Yeah. I want to be able to adjust my you know embouchure and my air to get a tone that that is authentic in that style. Yeah. And I don't sound like a jazz player trying to play that. Yeah. Just like I wouldn't want to sound like a rock or pop player trying to play jazz. Sure. So I have I've I've sort of settled on a mouthpiece in the past few years and read combo that I think is able to is malleable enough to get me through different yeah. situations, but is also a good conduit for whatever voice I have and letting that come through. Are you still with Rico? Are you still doing? No, actually, reads? I'm Van Doren. Very good. Van Doren, Very and I cool. use Van Doren mouthpieces now, and okay. and uh, reeds, and even a neck strap <laughs> and a ligature. Hey, everything. Man, you probably have a handkerchief that says Van Doren on I, it. Yeah, and I yeah. actually do have a, a windbreaker, and I also have a uh, yeah. <clears throat> a tumbler. Your family all got Van Doren beer koozies for Christmas this year. Yeah. <laughs> if only. <laughs> If only. That'll be next year's Christmas party. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we both do a lot of arranging. You do you do much more mm-hmm. than you're published through Kendor and mm-hmm. some other some other places. Mm-hmm. Much like an architect walking into a building, as an arranger and a composer, when you are playing someone else's arrangements and compositions, can mm-hmm. you turn it off? Can you simply play or are you always thinking critically Ooh. about and again, not getting specific and calling sure. people up, but just like when you are playing someone else's arrangements, are you always thinking, "Wow, I would have not put the DS there"? Or, no, wow, uh, you know this is, you know, <laughs> who would put a backwards repeat the first measure of page two? Or you know, whatever the th- some of the things are that, like, when you're reading that, some sometimes are just really careless or yeah. just different. It doesn't have to be a bad criticism, but are yeah. you always are you always watching the arrangement go by? Yeah, yeah, I am pretty yeah. much. It's it's tough to shut it off. It I is. mean, in the same way that. Um, my wife and I, I will talk about this quite a bit. She's a musician too. Okay. Uh, she is classically trained. She used to play the oboe. And so okay. she, she has an appreciation for classical music that I never really got. Yeah. And, um, it's very difficult for me to, I'll, t- I'll take you on a metaphor, but I promise it's related. So <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult for me to listen to class, especially classical era music, yeah. just because harmonically, I've been spoiled by the extended right. chords and harmonic variety of jazz and, yeah. and jazz fusion and stuff like that. So it's difficult for me, just from a harmonic perspective, to listen to that music because it's so predictable right. most of the time, right? But um, that is on me. It's my problem. Okay. I can't listen to it the right way. Okay. You know, um, and I, I'm working on it. 
I'm Mahler think I'm five will better. cure you of that. Yeah, I know. Mahler, Mahler will basically cure you of that. I, I, uh, my wife has recommended Mahler, and he's yeah. definitely on the list. Yeah, good. Um, I was just listening to Ravel the other day, so uh, I'm, I'm another good I'm, cure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, yeah. um, but I think the same thing happens with uh, you know arrangements and playing other people's music. You, you can't help but think critically. I, 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 to turn that part of my brain off would almost, for me, feel like I'm being lazy or I'm not mm-hmm. participating in the music the yeah. way that I should be. Yeah. Um, just it goes back to that listening critically thing. I, I always want to pay. It's a struggle, but I, I, I feel like it's a uh, the end game is to you know give the music the listening that it requires and deserves. And the same thing goes with when you're playing someone's arrangement. You you do you know want to appreciate the thoughts that they put into it in order to to create that music. Yeah. So. Do you have a um, you have a go to musical search? So like when you're just completely alone, you're gonna drive for thirty minutes. Mm-hmm. Is there something that you go to with great irregularity, or is there something that mm. you sometimes will just listen to on repeat more than something else? That you don't have to be, you don't have to answer to anyone else and feel that you're boring someone else in the car or around. But is there something that you will go to sooner than you will go to mm. something else? Well, I embarrassingly enough, it's some, uh, you know, oftentimes it's not even music because sometimes I. I to listen, like I said, to listen to music critically that way yeah. that I task myself with, it feels like work, right? Yeah. And so I have to be in the right mindset, I think, and I have to have the energy to, to give to the music what it what it needs. So a lot of times I'll listen to podcasts yeah. or talk radio or something like that just because I can sort of tune that out a little yeah. bit more and just relax more. Yeah. Because music of any, it doesn't again, it doesn't really matter what style, but um, if I'm listening to the music the way that I think it should be listened to. That's a lot of work. Mm-hmm. And um, sometimes I just don't have the energy for it. But I'm very much a sort of um, episodic listener where I'll get really deep into something yeah. and just obsess over it. Um, I'll have, you know, like I, I like remembering back to past uh, summers when we have lots of listening time. Yeah. And I think, oh, that album was the album of the summer. Right. Uh, that album was the sure. album of the winter, whatever it was. Yeah. And, and uh and so I have an album like that right now that I'm getting into. But I also have, um, like I'm sure every musician does, I have a Spotify to listen to yep. thing where someone will recommend an album I haven't heard yet. Yep. And so uh, that's on, it's on the listening list to go. Yeah. But then, again, that's more sort of doing work. Yeah. Um, not to say that I can't be, you know, listening to music can't be enjoyable or anything, obviously. But, um, you know, I think as musicians we listen to music in an intellectual way. Um, not just for not just for pleasure. Yeah. Um, so there's not one thing that I return to. Uh, of course, we all have our desert island discs and all sure, that stuff. Absolutely. But then, there's not one thing that I return to more often than anything else. Uh, it would probably be my go-to thing when I first sit down in the car if I have a long drive, which I do mm-hmm. <laughs> almost every day. You live in Libertyville, so yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I have it. Yeah, so it's built into it. Yeah, is just uh, yeah. T- t- podcasts. I really, I really like podcasts a lot. You have an, a podcast app where you just go yeah. To I- okay. Yeah, it's it's the iTunes podcast app, okay. and you know, you got, I got my favorites in there. Yeah. I mean, my son is even my five year old son is even into it now. Wow, that's cool. You know, they make kids podcasts, oh, sure. kids stories and stuff. So he's he's even on the on the bandwagon now. Wow, that is great. The new, let's talk about the new. Let's talk about sort of what's happening now. What's mm-hmm. what's new? Let's talk about the new album. Mm-hmm, Obviously, sure. it's called Bonfires. Yeah, Bonfire. Uh, Bonfire. One, just one. Yeah, just yeah, one. Just one. Okay. Bon, where was it recorded? It was recorded here in Chicago at Transient Sound. I love Transient. Yeah, it's a great studio, and uh, my favorite engineer Scott Steinman, yep. who normally doesn't work at Transient, but um, I was able to get that studio and get Scott on board too. Yep. Um, Brian Schwab mixed and mastered it. Great. Uh, used to do videography actually, yep. but uh, kind of stepping into the the sonic thing now. Does he so, do that out of his house, or does he do? Yeah, okay. I think he does. I think he's got he's got a home studio, so yeah. Well, during the mixing and mastering process, were you thinking about? Let's. Are you going physical discs? Are you going just digital? What are mm. you? What is? What's going to be the end result? Availability for the album. It's it's going to be all all the above. I think that just even though CDs are kind of going the way of the they dinosaur. Are. If you don't have physical copies of your album, though, you, you can't. Just, it's really hard to tour unless you're a massive group. You have to exactly. have to be able to sell something. Yeah, and I think I also think radio stations are just, they are accepting CDs. They, yeah. they don't just accept digital. At yeah. least now, who knows? In ten years, maybe it'll be different. But 
Yeah, so you kind of do. I did a short run of CDs. I, I only printed less than I normally do just yeah. because we always have so many extras lying around and everything. But uh, So I did kind of a shorter run this year. But, yeah, of course, I, I understand and have accepted that m- this will probably be consumed in digital streaming platforms, mostly just because that's the way things go now. Yeah. But yeah, I have I have some physical copies too, and I know that the vinyl thing. I don't know if you've vinyl done that thing, before. Yeah, but I'm, I'm considering it for the next project as well. I yeah, <laughs> I think it's it's coming back for sure. But I've also I had friends that have gone that route and not seen success with that either. Um, so I didn't do any vinyl this time. I'm I'm not a big vinyl collector. I have a little collection and everything, yeah. but my turntable doesn't even work. So. Yeah. I'm not. Uh, if I was like a big vinyl head, I might want to go that direction. Sure. But I, I didn't. I decided not to this time. On tour, I rec- on our recent tour, I actually did all my albums on a thumb drive. Oh yeah, I've heard and of that too. That yeah, sold better, almost better than than my CDs. It's really interesting. So it's a really and there's a, there's a whole now a marketplace for custom thumb drives and, and things like that. It's definitely. Interesting, all the things, all the things you can do. That's a good and download cart. I've heard too. Download cards are a thing. They're a thing now. And so it's you and Stuart and Clark and Dana. Mm -hmm. Dana, yeah. Um, Any other special guests, or is it just you keep it? Just the just the four of us. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. How long did it take to record? Yeah. Oh, actually, I I blocked out two days, but these guys, the level that they were at and the level of preparation, we got everything done in one day. Sometimes some of the takes are the first take, which is not a beautiful thing. I've had a couple yeah. of projects where, and you're nervous because, like, I don't want to touch this. I know, I know. Yeah. Like, well, I should probably do another take, but yeah. But you lose the spot. You know, first takes always have a spontaneity to them, whether yeah. it's good or bad. That that you cannot capture with subsequent ones. There's an element of hanging on for your life when you're when you're doing a tune that brings brings an element of of life to it because yes, right. everyone is hyper tuned in. Absolutely, and. That, that that can be hard to recapture once once you're. Uh, did you, Absolutely right. Yeah. Do you do everything live, or do you ever go back and do punch-ins and edits and things like that? Is that a world? Because some people are like, no, it has to all be one take. And yeah. I don't know that I always agree. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I. I don't have any problem with going in and you know splicing or editing. Yeah. I, just as long as it sounds natural. Correct. You know, I, I, it doesn't really. I don't. Doesn't yeah. bother me. No. I'm, but yeah, I'm, there's a couple of edits here and there. It's there's nothing crazy or anything. No. And there's no. Yeah. There's certainly no. There, I remember in our album, um, there was a the end of one of the tunes. It actually ends with um, before the return to the head, the bass playing the head, the the melody. Yeah. Well, then he's also playing the downbeat of the return, but the melody is ending up here, and the the downbeat oh. is down there. And so Patrick was was he actually caught it? We were listening back in the studio, and he's like, "Unless we, you know, I can't make that jump and yeah. make it sound normal. I have to finish this phrase. Oh right, yeah, and yeah. Then yeah, I have yeah. to come, back, come in. back in. So we went back in and played one note. He just punched in, <laughs> just punched in one note, and That's I thought funny. it makes sense. And the end result, yeah. In live, you might make an adjustment or not worry about it, but yeah, it was yeah. just on, when we were listening to it back, there was that lack of deep end on the return to the head. It was like, you know what, we need that. So yeah. splicing one note, you know, or whatever it is, um, not a big deal. Again, or, you know, you're you're not, and and also look at look at the success and the, all the creativity that Miles oh. and uh, his producer, what's his producer's name in the seventies? Oh, yeah, uh, uh, T.O. I guess, okay. right? I mean. Um, Back then, using studio manipulation like a, like a rock band would do, and they came up with such interesting albums in the seventies. Well, so Steely, Steely Dan, I mean, well, for crying yeah. out loud, yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah, yeah. Again, I think the end was going back to what you said before. The end result, helping people listen critically, whether you did it mm-hmm. all in one take or whether there was or it's edits here, I don't think is is. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. Here's an interesting question. Um, and the it's hard to answer this question without sounding egotistical. Well, that's not the it's not the goal of the question. Mm-hmm. The goal of the question is sort of from a leadership perspective, from a musician perspective. If someone were to say, "What's your sort of your unfair advantage? What sets you apart from yeah. someone else?" Why would someone say, "Oh, call Chris for that"? Not putting any other horn players no. down, but just like. Why would why would someone need to call you? And what what sort of when you walk into a room of saxophonists, what's sort of your unfair advantage? Yeah, well, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say ad, advantage. I mean, um, I guess what I would say is 
the beautiful thing about jazz and you know improvised music um I have to cu- stop using the word creative music because I think all music is creative, you know. And so that that term, I know that's kind of a yep. kind of a tried thing to say, but okay. I try to. I have to stop myself saying creative music because, sure. well, yeah. Anyway, the yeah. The, um, the beautiful thing about jazz is that it's not necessarily about who's better. I mean, there are definitely degrees of you know virtuosity that right. you know right. one sure. person's better at this or has better technique or whatever, but it's just the the, the individuality. It's like being an actor, right? right. Um, so if you don't, if you're not cast in a role, it's because you're just, it's not because you're a bad actor necessarily, right. it's because you're just not the right person for Correct. that role. So one thing that I've been struggling with, I think that we all struggle with, is to when you, when you realize that, you know, you weren't chosen for something, it's not personal. It's not right. the fact that somebody thinks you're bad. It's right. just that you're not your voice is just not the right voice for that particular thing. Right. And so I'd like to think that, you know, I've been focusing on highlighting and enhancing my personal voice for ever. (laughs) And that's kind of been, you know, I think think one of the things we aspire to as jazz musicians, maybe the thing that we all look for is to try to be identifiable and be ourselves on the instrument, you know, and to try to sound not like you're playing the instrument, but like like you're you. You know, and you just happen to be playing this instrument. Yep. Um, and so uh, I'd like to think that my voice is clear, or at least that I'm getting toward a sense of clarity with, with my, my personal voice on the instrument. And if someone decides that that works for, their, for that per project, then that's great. And um, trying to be cool with uh, understanding that your voice might not be right for a certain project mm-hmm. is a, kind of a mind game yeah. that I think we all play. But yeah. Um, yeah, I'd like I'd like to hope that people know what they're getting. Yeah, you know, because I have a, a clarity to it. Yeah. Uh, that I've tried to enhance. Yeah. So and and being in New York is really helpful oh, for that too. By yeah. the way, because fondue pot of, of voices. Oh my and, God, yeah, 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 it's just um, trying to stick out from the crowd. You know, that's one thing I learned about New York: highlighting your individuality, your originality, and really ro- running with that and yeah. just going full bore with that. Absolutely. You know? Last question: Say you could go back. Um, knowing all that you know up to this point in your life, the roads you've walked down, the people you've encountered, the problems you've had to solve, the whether musical or non, if you were to encounter Chris Madison on the cusp of going out into the world and going to school or doing those things, hmm. what bit of advice would you say? You know, what what encouragement or yeah, what what encouragement or advice would you tell your younger self yeah. before, you, before you head out? Well, I think to capitalize on the, the the question I answered before, you know, I would I would try to advise myself to not take things personally in yeah. this business. I mean, it is such a tough business in the sense that the lines between friendship and business associate are so murky. Yep. Um and sometimes non-existent. Yeah. Um and you 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 cannot uh, get hung up on on not things not going the way that you intended. And, you know, all you can do the only thing you can you can really handle is yourself and how you yeah. how you sound and how much preparation you've put in, and that's the only thing you have control over. And um, just trying to be happy and accept things the way that they naturally unfold yeah. is something I would I would tell my younger self to keep in mind. Yeah. Not that it's easy, not that right. you not that you hear that advice and all of a sudden you're like, "Oh, great, oh, great. Gonna... everything's great." Right. <laughs> everything's... No, yeah. <laughs> but if you keep it in mind, um I think it it's better overall for your for your mental well-being uh Absolutely. because it's so easy to get inside your head and overthink things. And I know I've had disagreements and arguments especially when I was younger about you know, not not being chosen or someone else getting a gig, and you know, I would I would I would be confrontational about it. Yeah. And I, you know, but it's not going to win you any friends to be that way, and it's not going to change anything. So there's yeah. no reason to do that or to to um, to be that way. Sure, you know. Well, I can't wait to hear Bonfire. I can't Thanks, wait to man. see what's next. And Thank you. 
I've got so many gigs of yours I need to get to. I need to get to the Kings of the Lobby. I feel like I'm like a fangirl on YouTube on a lot of the stuff that you're doing. <laughs> and but it's it's really it's special that to have you on to have you on here to, to hear sort of the inner workings of your mind and how you're approaching things. And I hope that people are you know if they're still listening to this point, um, just what, what what you can get out of what you can get out of this. So thank you so much for taking the man, time. My pleasure. I my really, an honor to be really chosen and I really it. appreciate you asking. Thanks, me. Thanks, man. Thanks so much. Yeah, my pleasure.